Good evening to uh, all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Ivan Veuda. I'm a permanent fellow here at the Institute. And I have the really great pleasure uh, and honor to uh, introduce our speaker and commentator to uh, prominent professors, ladies, uh, who are also fellows here uh, at the Institute uh, this year. And um, the speaker tonight is Luisa uh, Bielashevich. Beautiful. How was that? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Bielashevich, uh, who is um, professor of European governance at the University of Amsterdam and who has traveled the world. Her original home country is Poland, lived in Trieste, which is a favorite city of mine and of many of us and who is a geographer. Mm -hmm. And the title of, of the talk tonight is, you see, uh, Border Work in the City, and the subtitle is Affective Geopolitics and the Landscapes of Urban Fear. So, wow, that's a huge bundle. And I think we're all going to enjoy uh, the talk, and I'm sure we will have many, many questions. So it's great to have you with us, Louisa. And then, of course, uh, no need to be really introduced because Ruth uh, has uh, already presented here, uh, is the recipient of a lifetime award here in, in Vienna, but is, uh, as it says here, Emerita Distinguished Professor of Discourse Studies at Lancaster uh, University. So thank you both very much. Uh, this was a little mise en scène uh, because uh, Louisa will do a presentation from the rostrum with a PowerPoint and Ruth and I will move to the front row. So thank you very much again for being with us. Louisa, please take the floor. Thank you so much, Ivan, and thank you, Ruth, especially for being willing to present two weeks in a row, <laughs> actually, which is quite something. So um, I'm actually really fortunate to be able to follow your lecture, which many of you attended as well, because I want to, in many ways, kind of link up directly to some of the things that you're saying. Um, although while Ruth's talk focused quite directly on a kind of shifting discursive constructions of borders, of the bordering of the nation, specifically of the Austrian nation, what I want to do, precisely as a geographer, is to get us to think about how such discourses, how such understandings touch down in space. Okay? Um, and in particular, I want us to think about how they touch down in urban spaces and how they're increasingly being made, um, let's say, kind of the object of activism um, by a variety of right nationalist, if not directly fascist, groups and parties. So what really interests me, and I guess what I want to kind of tease out with you today, and I really want to kind of restrain my talk to at most 40 minutes, so we have plenty of time for discussion, because I really want to take advantage of you and the audience for feedback on a project that's very much ongoing. Um, what really interests me is how these various movements, and I'm looking at Italy in particular, but I hope we can make some links to other European countries. I want to look at how they claim to narrate, but also actually delimit physically, um, the difference and the distinction, the borders between the spaces of nativity and foreignness um, through a range of interventions. And I'll give you some examples of those interventions that rely upon a very kind of targeted occupation of space and also um, what I will try to kind of highlight to you as a selective visibilization. So um, as I said, I want to link what we're going to be talking about today to some of the points made by Ruth, much of the work that many of you in the audience are doing as well. So kind of thinking about how these very localized politics, very grounded politics, link up to broader agendas and ideas. Now, in Ruth's lecture last week, one of the things that she noted was how in the kind of evolving discourse of emergency and exceptionality that accompanied the 2015-2016 hospitality crisis, because I didn't think we want to call it the refugee crisis, the catalogue of um, 
potential dangers um, to Europe and to Europeans uh, represented by the large scale arrivals kind of expanded its reach with the passing of months. And especially, um, as you noted, Ruth, with the events in Cologne and other German cities on New Year's Eve 2015. So the refugee as potential terrorist um, very quickly became also in the popular immediatized attention, also scripted as a potential abductor, rapist, molester, um, and so on. And especially this idea of the female body under attack um, became the embodiment of a wider attack on Europe itself, on its values, um, on its social and public order, and so on. And whether in Austria, as you illustrated, but also Poland, Germany, the Netherlands, where I live, the call to preserve the safety of European women and to preserve public order and public safety became such a dominant part of media and political discourse. Across Europe, kind of thinking about the interventions, the physical interventions that accompanied this, um, a number of parties, so whether the Dutch PVV, um, the Lega Nord in Italy, began to stage various events um, in major cities, um, but also in smaller cities, events that ranged from um, citizens' patrols um, to distributing pepper spray to women as uh, my own, I don't know if I want to call him my own, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands said, to women abandoned by the state. And in that very moment, so this is the spring of 2016, I happened to be here in Vienna and happened to be in the center of town where on the 8th of March, so poignantly International Women's Day, um, a minor right faction in the parliament that Ruth told me no longer exists, Team Stronach, was giving out pepper spray on the steps of the parliament. Now, again, perfect Women's Day <laughs> kind of outreach activity. This was not a huge event. Um, even by the kind of estimates of the organizers, they said that, you know, they handed out about 200 bottles of pepper spray. Um, but it was part of a much more kind of pervasive momentum gathering on the media and not just of the tabloid variety. And I want you to keep this example in mind because it's relevant to the other examples that I want to cite. Because it's, again, not the numbers that matter so much, because the numbers in this case were quite minor, but rather this kind of public performance of insecurity and what to do about it, right? So if you're giving out pepper spray, you're insinuating that, you know, perhaps you don't need it now, but you certainly might. Now, of course, these sorts of appeals are nothing new. They are not new to nationalist discourses. Um, I mean, and they have, as we all well know, much longer colonial lineages as well. But I think, you know, kind of looking at how in the European context, um, this threat has become increasingly sexualized actually already since 9-11. I mean, this is a very important um, point also because appeals to um, sexual rights, most kind of much more broadly conceived, have become increasingly a way of rationalizing more and more restrictive immigration policies. And, um, you know, it's, interesting, and Ruth, you pointed out to some of this, to think about how calls, whether for gender equality or sexual rights more broadly, are providing a litmus test, not just for the selection, but also integration of immigrants, particularly from the Muslim world, in different forms of what um, Sarah Farris in her book calls feminationalisms, right? Um, adopted, again, not by right nationalist movements alone, but actually incorporated into integration policy in a number of European states by now. And this includes Finland, Belgium, and the Netherlands, which were in many ways a front runner in this. What has shifted in this discussion, and this is where I kind of want to take us tonight, and this is a shift that has been happening over the past couple of years, is that women have become just one of the vulnerable subjects that needs to be protected, um, cared for, um, secured, First, by the institutions of the state, of course, and failing that by activist citizens themselves. So colleagues working in the Scandinavian context, um, looking at the urban activism of populist right parties, especially in um, Sweden and Finland, have been describing how a very particular kind of what they call caring self is being created in the discourse of these parties to support directly racist views but legitimized with the worry about others. And they refer to it as care racism. And I wanted to read you their description here. 
They say they use this concept to describe the ways in which the logic of blood bonds, which regulates traditional family and its division of labor based on an understanding of men as protectors and women as caring, and you'll see in, in, in these parties both of these things act, function as a central frame. These notions of caring for our own um, are articulated particularly among female members of these parties and of the broader racist social movements. So these movements, they note, are not only articulating um, their kind of political views through a rhetoric of hate, because of course they do that quite powerfully, but also by notions of care and love for the family and for the community, a community of course very tightly delimited and defined. As I said, these discourses um, and practices of care um, do not only target the protection of women, but more broadly, as I said, the protection and assurance of social and economic rights of citizens, quote, abandoned by the state. And so very closely associated with a wider kind of repurposing of social justice agendas for quite exclusionary nationalist ends. Um, you've all heard the terms welfare chauvinism, welfare populism, all of these are, to one degree or another, based upon calls to refound national politics on territorial grounds. So to reclaim communities in one way or another from the assault of globalizing and neoliberalizing forces. But this desired re-territorialization of rights does not only, again, have to do with the calls to limit, for example, welfare access um, to nationals within the state territory. Of course, it does that as well. And by now, that has become something that you know, even uh, centrist parties are quite happy to propose. Um, it also includes a variety of other claims to space. Okay? A national space envisioned um, not just as violated by migrant flows, that's there too, but more broadly as degraded, abandoned, vulnerable. So abandoned citizens, but also abandoned territories have equally become the battleground here. And I was just thinking, and maybe we can kind of talk about this later, how the Gilets Jaunes have been instrumentalized by Le Pen, but not only. And I was struck how colleagues who are geographers and in some ways should know better, have also been writing some very problematic assessments of the geography of this movement, but we can come back to that. So, Many of these imaginations are, of course, are extremely simplistic and appeal to understandings that only very partially reflect actual kind of territorial economic differences um, or actually reflect the actual territorial distribution of migrants in a country. But as various studies have shown, and I'm happy to come back to this later, um, they, you know, this, these kind of differences are the object of quite powerful misperceptions. Um, and certainly that's the case in the Italian context. But perceptions matter a lot. And better yet, what is perceived, how and where, matters a great deal. Um, and that's the kind of the point that I want to kind of use to lead us into the discussion of some of the examples I want to bring you. So um, my former colleague in Amsterdam, cultural theorist Mika Bau, who many of you will be familiar with, uses the notion of focalization okay, to draw attention to what she says is the ways in which particular regimes of visibility are conjured and materialized, how they're consolidated on the ground. So focalization, the way she uses it, is a narratological term, and it's defined as the relationship between the elements presented, so that which is seen or perceived, and the vision through which they are presented. So in other words, getting us to think who sees and what becomes visible or invisible through their eyes. So what I want to do is to devote the rest of the talk, in a sense, to a discussion of this very particular politics of visibility, of territorial visibility, enacted by what is one of the, unfortunately, most visible and better known new fascist movements in Italy, um, with which I assume many of you will be unfortunately familiar. I'm speaking here about Casa Pound, and I say, unfortunately, um, better known since it is a movement that is very minor, um, you know, still thankfully small numbers. It obtained less than 1% of the vote in the last national elections, but it has captured very successfully both national but also international 
public attention. These are two front page headlines from The Guardian and The New York Times before the elections, actually from, from February. Um, both pieces that you know, kind of would make it seem that they're you know, kind of poised to take over the Italian political context. Um, the Guardian also devoted a long read to the movement. Um, also, you know, I'm happy to talk about that as well. So what I want to do, I mean, keeping this in mind that this is a minor political force, but I will say why I think they are important regardless, is to get us to think how through Casa Pound's eyes, to go back to the point about focalization, but also through their acts, the political gaze, national but also international, is drawn to what they present as the degraded Italian city, to the growing precarity of Italians, those left behind. Um, it's drawn to a corrupt political class and an economic crisis that has very inequitably um, impacted Italian society. But let me start with a bit of background. So the movement um, has its start and is still headquartered in the Esquilino district of Rome. Um, in an apartment building that's actually right behind the Termini Central Station in Vienna Monte Napoleone. So this building, um, there is its facade, it was first occupied as a squat in 2003, but since then has become both the operational headquarters, um, but also kind of flagship pro project of the movement, and it currently provides housing to 18 families, so families but also individuals. And as they say, you know, families in need who some, for one reason or another, would not qualify for public housing. Apart from this um, um, faux marble, um, kind of neoclassical 1920s kind of script on the facade, it's just a kind of nondescript apartment building on a big street that has banks, um, shops, lots of Chinese shops actually, right, as I said, behind the central station. What is interesting about them is that from their inception, they focus their sites very specifically on new forms of organizing, even though um, many of the original founders come from the youth movement of the MSAE, which was the Italian fascist party. With this, they aimed to um, go beyond previous institutional fascist youth organizations and focus especially on both symbolically and physically occupying and defending <laughs> urban spaces including um, establishing a presence in those which were always traditionally the red regions of Italy, Tuscany especially, which is quite striking. Um, the poster that I have here, this is a kind of poster from the streets, comes from the period right before the last elections, from a rally in Lucca with various members um, of, uh, or those running for the various municipal can, uh, council and also mayoral candidates, so from Luca, Grosseto, Parma and Pistoia with the rubric, as you see here, let's defend our cities. Casa Pound describes themselves as fascists of the third millennium. And from their outset, as I said, they have been striving to adopt not just kind of uh, activities and ways of framing uh, their work that are different for, to the previous kind of fascist youth organizations, but directly activist practices of left social movements. They explicitly appeal to um, a Gramscian metapolitical approach and cite Gramsci repeatedly, um, focused as they would say on broad-based cultural interventions centered around what they will say is an activist claiming of rights. And so in the interviews that I did with them last year, this notion of metapolitics was repeatedly um, invoked, especially in talking about how kind of constant, incremental, symbolic, but also physical interventions, presence, was crucial to the making of a new politics. And also they keep, you know, kept repeating this term, kind of making of new spaces of political possibility. Now, um, you know, the, the appeal to kind of metapolitical um, activism, of course, is not unique to Casa Pound, many other integralist, if you want to call it that, um, or identitarian movements do very much the same thing. Um, but I think in the case of Casa Pound, what is interesting is how they translate these sorts of understandings into a practice of urban politics. And indeed, their practices have focused on what have been traditionally um, left preoccupation, so the right to housing, to social protection, and apart from the campaigns they've done for public housing, another um, strong one in this 
this is um, both a flyer and something that has appeal, uh, appeared on all of their social media kind of presences. It's a campaign for a social mortgage that um, is going to have a you know, kind of blocked interest rate, um, will block your payments in case of unemployment. They've also been very active in food drives. This is a picture taken in Rome, and this one is actually from Trieste. Um, or, kind of returning to my points about femonationalism, um, courses in women's safety, kind of offering women's self-defense uh, courses. This is from Naples from a couple of months back. But also um, the rights of women as both, quote, workers and mothers. And this was an ongoing campaign that they also presented um, through other right parties to the parliament for um, extended leave for working mothers. They flag these interventions in kind of capillary fashion with stickers on lampposts, you know, kind of those stickers that everybody puts up for, you know, I don't know, transports, <laughs> moving companies and so on, but also leaflets that they leave in supermarkets in, you know, distinct areas of town. So this one, this flyer, for example, kind of lists their various forms of assistance, um, whether, you know, kind of food assistance, but also um, the one that says Consulenza Ricorsi Equitalia, they will talk to the collection agency for you. And they, you know, one of the activists I interviewed said, yes, because, you know, for example, these poor older people, you know, the phone company is taking advantage of them, and especially, you know, maybe they don't pay their bills. So we will get on the phone and we will do that for them. Um, so like various other identitarian um, movements around Europe, they also define themselves as, quote, neither right nor left, but rather very firmly as social movements. So really hijacking that term, because they will say, we work in the social. I don't know how much sense that makes in English. You'd say, lavorando nel sociale, you work in the social, right? What is more, as a social movement, what, um, what they will argue is that they are forced to take political action to provide answers to unmet and urgent social needs. So they will deploy various direct action interventions, such as um, forcible occupation of public housing, blocking evictions, actions that they will call social extremism, again, a social extremism dictated by extreme circumstances. Now. Um, I want to say something a bit more specific about how the movement has made the kind of the degradation and abandonment of city spaces its crucial point of action um, and tell you something about um, one particular context, and that is Ostia, which is um, uh, the, let's say, the, the seaside bit of Rome, um, once um, the imperial port. But in the lead up to the Italian elections in the spring of 2018, a place that unfortunately captured national and not only national attention due to a series of incidents. Um, once very much a kind of uh, Rome's kind of seaside resort, a bustling seaside resort. Most recently, Ostia was put under special measures and in fact its entire kind of municipal administration disbanded when um, national investigators actually took down the entire municipal administration of Rome as part of the Mafia Capitale scandal. Apart from this, Ostia has been in the grip for over a decade of uh, a number of rival clans that manage pretty much everything in the city, from beach concessions to restaurants, etc., etc. Now, Ostia came, unfortunately, to public prominence when um, a Rai TV crew reporting, I'm not going to show you the video because it's horrible, but it was on the Italian news for, I swear, one month. You could not open the news without seeing this being replayed over and over again. So there is a Rai TV crew that goes to Ostia to report on the dealings of this clan. Um, and the reporter is brutally attacked. He's actually headbutted. And so there is this video of him getting headbutted and then chased down the street by this man. Now, as you notice in my account of Ostia, um, Migrants do not appear anywhere, right? I mean, this was, you know, Ostia's degradation, as it may be, was entirely an autochthonous affair, right? From the clans to, you know, kind of dilapidated and abandoned public housing projects, failing transportation, abandoned green spaces, um, such as this one, um, and even the archaeological park of Ostia Antica, which has been um, uh, left to ruin. In these months, Ostia became Casa Pound's kind of key project to draw attention to what they said um, was, you know, kind of a, a symbolic um, Italian city in its degradation and also in its abandonment of Italians. 
and to add to this of, you know, kind of the effects of a corrupt local political class. And as I said, although the presence of migration here was never an issue and was not an issue in this moment either, in Casa Pound's both kind of discursive and material interventions, they very ably kind of wove the Ostia situation and the Ostia context into a wider kind of narrative of abandonment of Italian cities and of Italians. So from the reclamation of playgrounds, like this one in the poster, to sit-ins and interventions to block evictions from Ostia's really dilapidated public apartment complexes that were referred to as the Casa di Ricotta, houses made of ricotta, because they were literally falling apart, crumbling. The Casa Pound boys, as they became known, became very visible in the municipality, um, so much so that even the left or left center press, like Repubblica, began to write you know, on, on an almost kind of daily fashion reports in the Rome, Rome section of Repubblica of what was happening prognosticating that with the lead up to the elections, because Casa Pound had actually fronted several candidates to the city council, they could get up to 20%. They didn't, they got nine. They did elect one candidate to the municipal council. But what is interesting to me, what I want to read to you is a couple of quotes from this article from Repubblica that appeared right before the election, because I think they illustrate well the, these kind of politics of visibilization and presence. This is what the, um, those interviewed by Repubblica say. These guys are always present. They are real fighters. They take care of those in need. Unlike all the others, they just appeared here before the elections. And I'll read you just the very end of this one because I think it's quite revealing. Um, Who cares if they're fascists, xenophobes, racists? They care about the poor people and that's what matters. And I can guarantee it and I'm a communist. So, um, I want to return to Mika Bal's notion of focalization here because I want to argue that it's really crucial to the success of a small movement like Casa Pound, both through their claiming of visibility in space, um, through physical presence, really capillary presence on the territory, and this refrain that was repeated in this article, but many others, you know, they would say, loro ci sono, they're there. Um, and something that also returned in my interviews with them, we're there, we're, we're on the ground. But also, and this is equally important, in the ways in which they succeed in drawing the eye and making visible the, quote, problems that need addressing, but also, of course, the solutions. Um, through their food drives um, that have taken place over the past several years, not just in Rome, but actually in quite a few other Italian cities, um, usually in very kind of centrally located um, supermarkets. So you know, you'll see these shopping bags full of groceries. They not only lay claim to providing for popular welfare, because of course they do not. I mean, these are, you know, kind of minor interventions. What they manage to do, and this is perhaps much more powerful, they manage to draw public attention to what they argue is the absence of the Italian state for ordinary Italians. And so through these actions, and especially through the multiplication of these actions through mass media outlets that take it up very kind of avidly, unfortunately, so it's not just these actions, but they're, you know, kind of echoes, they very ably succeeded in what I would argue has been a kind of a spectacularization of social precarity. While kind of less than obliquely, let's say, um, hinting that this logic of crisis is somehow induced also by the non-Italian others. Um, since the state spends on housing and feeding migrants, we must take care of the Italians, they will argue. And so in the interviews that I did with them, they kept repeating the need for such interventions, not just because the state isn't there, but there was another kind of moral geography there. Um, Italians have a different approach to poverty, I was told. They're ashamed to ask for assistance publicly, unlike the migrants, who have no problem being seen either begging on the street or queuing for assistance. Those who come to the house, um, one of the activists told me, so the house in Via Montenapolone, um, in Via Napoleone, um, when they come to pick up to the house, um, we have to hide the food for them. They're ashamed to be seen. And so the food drives also kind of serve to refocalize a very particular, as I said, moral geography of proper behavior in public space. So the foreign beggars and the Italians who somehow suffer their poverty in private. Now, 
I've kept saying that you know we need to keep in mind that this is still a minor movement, that their electoral success has been quite limited. But what they've been doing, and these kind of modes of focalization matter because they've been very directly taken up um, by not, other, not, not just other far-right factions like Forza Nuova, but most importantly condoned, if not directly taken up by Lega politicians who are not just now in the government, they are the government. Um, now, um, I'll leave you this quote here from the deputy mayor of my poor Trieste, um, who, you know, kind of replaying this, uh, this idea of, you know, kind of security, citizen security patrols is just one example. And this for the leg, of course, is nothing new. I mean, they have engaged very similar kind of uh, imaginaries of a disintegrating Italy embattled by the forces of unfettered globalization, of unregulated migration. I mean, this has been a kind of ongoing leg imaginary since the early 2000s. Um, but that has shifted as well, and the very strongly, not just territorialized, but racialized um, moral geographies of rights that the Lega is propounding can directly come out of the Casa Pound playbook. And I'll cite you here, actually, just one example. Um, this is from an interview that I carried out um, with colleagues with um, then the Lega MP and now the governor of the Friuli Venezia Giulia um, region, Massimiliano Fedriga. And I'll just let you read it because in terms of, again, this kind of particular kind of moral geographies of what is owed to whom, I think it's quite, um, quite indicative. Now, Fedriga became a quite vocal protagonist in the post-election period with his calls for an immediate restructuring of migrant reception and a complete revision of family policies, quote, imposed by the center left with what he actually managed to call a very different type of care, calling for the reinstitution of closed detention centers and especially the abandonment of um, the kind of model of diffused reception that was very successful in the region. Um, they're called sparar centers. In Italian, I'm happy to say something more about that. So these were centers that provided either, you know, kind of temporary or longer term hospitality in diffused kind of accommodation, so rather than in camps and centers. This is important because this very policy has not just been taken up by the Lega government, but just last week has been made into law. And this is the point that I want to close with. So um, just last week, the Italian parliament passed what is called in Italian the Decreto Sicurezza, or the security decree, um, also dubbed the Salvini decree. And this was a front page headline from The Guardian from Friday. It's a decree with sweeping powers um, of, you know, kind of uh, addressing security or better yet insecurity in a variety of ways. But the one that I want to kind of draw attention to is that with one legislative act abolishing the right to humanitarian protection. And this was a right that was uh, reserved for migrants who would not qualify for refugee status, but who could not be returned to their country of origin. Now, um, this is important um, in the Italian um, context because um, over 25% of all um, uh, instances you know, were given actually this sort of humanitarian protection. I've got um, actually a slide here um, with only you know, kind of 8% of those applying be being given refugee status. Um, Apart from uh, creating a legal framework allowing these migrants to remain on Italian territory, these permits were also very important. Um, they could vary from six months to up to two years because they've also provided a framework for reception and even potentially integration. So they would allow migrants to work, to receive assistance from a variety of these centers. Um, so very kind of successful model of diffuse reception. As of last week, again, with one fell swoop, all of those benefiting from humanitarian protection, I mean, and this is a law that's not only going to be applied to those arriving, but also retroactive, they will lose all of these rights. Moreover, the centers that have so far been housing them will have to be shut down. Um, and I had a figure here before, I mean, literally with one swell, uh, you know, kind of one fell swoop, um, anywhere between 100 to 150,000 Caritas um, estimates people will be made illegal. 
in place of humanitarian um, protection. Here, actually, I'll show you this. This is just to give you a sense of who has benefited from humanitarian protection um, in the last period. So you can see um, quite a variety of um, nationalities. I mean, my guess, actually, I was talking to Christopher at lunch, and it was that it would have been, you know, kind of people mostly coming from West Africa, but it's a much wider range of, um, of nationalities. So what is going to replace this? In lieu of humanitarian protection, um, the new specification is for a series of new special permits granted at the discretion of the authorities to quote victims of serious exploitation of domestic violence people whose country of origin has been hit by disaster those needing medical treatment and finally those who have performed acts of high civic value so you know exactly the sort of kind of humanitarian sorting of rights that people like ddfsn and others have written about very very troubling um what is more you know and this is the other innovation um the law introduces the possibility to deny and revoke asylum indeed to those who have either committed various crimes, but also asylum applications can be suspended or denied if somebody is considered socially dangerous. Now, um, clearly, um, I'll stay here for a second, this sort of hard-handed approach confirms Salvini's and the Lega's electoral promises, but it will hardly erase illegal migration from Italian territory. Quite the opposite. So especially the kind of retroactive application of this framework um, and, you know, kind of the destruction of existing institutions of humanitarian protection, you know, kind of on a wider scale, but also on a very local scale, will, as I said, literally produce illegal migrants because it will not only strip hundreds of thousands of people of the legal right to remain, but also of housing, medical care, and you know, a whole series of other basic rights. So what it will do, it will expel vulnerable individuals, families out onto the streets. So if the Lega stated concern, certainly in its promises, was to make Italian cities safe and livable for Italians, this should be hardly the way to do it. So why? Um, since the decree was announced, the mayors of several large but also smaller Italian cities, Milano, Bologna, but also Torino, which is, by the way, governed by Cinque Stelle, coalition partner of the Lega, reacted immediately saying, basically, we're not going to be applying the terms of this decree because it will create a social bomb. And that's the term that's been used. But that, I would argue, is perhaps precisely the intent of the Lega. So stripping the recipients of humanitarian protection of access to basic services will force them into precarity, into the illegal economy, and into situations of both physical and psychological emergency. So I already mentioned the Caritas estimates that anywhere between 140 and 150,000 people will quote, and I'm reading this from the Caritas report from the weekend, um, it will expose these people to risk of extreme poverty, marginality, and deviance. And uh, Caritas has dubbed this as they call a pathogenic law, and I think that term is perfect. Um, so the decree will not only, as I said, manufacture illegality, it will also very willingly make it much more visible in the spaces of Italian cities, with these people literally thrust into abject conditions and forced to survive on the streets. But um, perhaps there is actually, I think, very much there is political utility in that as well. So forcing migrants into precarious conditions permits, I think, even more easily their dehumanization and then further securitization. And um, I think there are very you know, kind of uh, distressing historical parallels here with which you know, I think the Lega will need to grapple. Um, I will stop here, and I hope we can have um, more time for discussion that way. But thank you for your attention. Um, but I will leave you with a nicer picture. Um, Ruth had this wonderful image to close her presentation with. This is a uh, murales uh, graffiti that appeared on the Milano Modern Art Museum, Museum, just this weekend. And you see a policeman very much with the kind of physiognomy of Salvini taking away um, St. Nicholas. And this is the description. Um, Permiso di Sojourn, so residence permit has been denied to St. Nicholas um, because he's Turkish and off they go. <laughs> Thank you.
Does this work? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Luisa. This was really a fantastic lecture. And of course, I already knew some of it from Absolutely. our discussions <laughs> yesterday and over the time. And thank you also for linking it to my lecture. So I think there is a lot of really in interesting interdisciplinary issues we can talk about, both in methods but also in theory. Uh, you know, how discourse and materiality and re semioticizing discourse into walls or gates or what kind of segregation possibilities. Uh, how that works. So I think this is a uh, quote unquote wonderful field uh, to work together. So I have a, a couple of comments and then also questions because I think it's uh, many people would like to know more about your field work. I'm absolutely so um, uh, there are some questions, but I would like to start first with sort of. Is this something Italian, or do we experience that in other countries okay. as well? And, uh, um, well, last week you already heard quite a lot about Austria, and I hope I'm not getting on your nerves, but uh, <laughs> I do have to again say that a lot of this is happening here as well. And uh, this is a government where the far right, extreme right, is not the major party, but the smaller party. So uh, it's interesting to ask how does that happen and what are the histories to this and how can we frame it in a sort of more general way or is it really context dependent? So, you know, Italy is different than Austria is different than the Netherlands, etc. So I think there are some both is the case. Yeah, there are some obvious context-dependent issues, but also some quite uh, patterns which can be distinguished. And I want to mention a few. Uh, what I find very interesting is what you said about the visualization in space. So there are some Spanish uh, and also um, uh, British and Scandinavian studies in we were part of such a big European project with the name Xenophobe yeah? <laughs> um, in eight countries <laughs> where this gaze uh, became such an important symbolic moment. So we had focus groups and group discussions mm -hmm. and uh, many migrants in all these different countries from Poland to Malta and Cyprus mm -hmm. to England and Sweden and Austria said what is terrible is once they try to be vis visible or they don't even know that they are visible, they get this gaze. Yeah? And this is such an aggressive gaze so that they would actually like to disappear, both men and women. So it's not just a gaze to women, but many women said, OK, this is also why we wear the burqa, because we don't want this aggressive gaze to touch us. This is something I've heard in the UK quite a lot, because mm -hmm. here the burqa obviously is forbidden, so you don't hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's very aggressive. And so basically, uh, countries, and now I'm talking about migrants and not refugees, countries need migrants to work <laughs> for various things, but they shouldn't be visible. Uh, and so on the weekends, they should disappear, because that's leisure time. And so in Madrid, there was a you know, big debate about there are these migrants in the parks. Mm -hmm. So what do they do there? They shouldn't be there, because we actually don't want to see them. So this whole issue of visualization is a very interesting one. And uh, there's a very, very good paper by Helene Flam and uh, Brigitte um, something, my name will come back to me, uh, Bozami, uh, on this uh, gaze, yeah? what, what symbolic force that actually enacts in interaction in the streets, in the cities. And that leads me to a second point about strangers. How do we define strangers? Now, uh, you know, this is something many sociologists have obviously written about, and I really like to refer to Sigmund Baumann. I think he's written uh, excellent books and, mm -hmm. and papers about that, the postmodern stranger. So in, 
in juxtaposing that with sort of the modern stranger, which was usually the Jew. Yeah, so the Jew was in the city, but you couldn't really know if it, he, he or she was Jewish, except if they were religious Jews, but basically they were so-called fellow citizens, yeah? so Mitbürger, which is still a notion used in, in German, which I find terrible because I never know why I should be a Mitbürger. I'm actually a Bürger, <laughs> yeah? But um, so there's still this linguistic way of uh, sort of excluding uh, Jews and other autochthonous minorities. Mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, what Bauman talks about are the postmodern strangers, which are the destitute strangers, which are those who come alone, yeah, who are not a collective, who sort of either make it or not, don't make it, or drown, or somehow get into the countries. And these are the strangers which are now being attacked, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and they are visible yeah, in, in Rome or in Vienna or wherever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bauman then says, well, there are two ways uh, how societies cope with those strangers. And this metaphor of houses, nation, container comes into that. So either the societies digest them, that means they have to assimilate, they become like us, or the society vomits them. Yeah? So they, they spit them out. Yeah? And I think now, with what you say and what we experience in Austria, is we have a third notion. That means they are not immediately deported or abgeschoben, yeah? but they are criminalized, yeah? intentionally criminalized. Like you said, they, um, they lose all legal means. And in Austria now we have, I talked about this last week, we have these laws of linking minimum security benefits to language proficiency and uh, sort of refugees who, own, who haven't got asylum yet, who are asylum seekers, don't get anything, but uh, they also have to provide these language certificates and, and whatnot and <laughs> only get something after five years uh, with the thing that people have to, you know, we have to uh, protect and guarantee uh, benefits for those people who have paid in, yeah? not those who have not paid in. Yeah? Well, how should refugees have paid in? Yeah? This is a completely <coughs> paradox uh, uh, measure. And so what happens is you take away the minimum ways of securing life, yeah? so uh, they can't work, uh, they're not allowed to work. Um, in Austria, they're not allowed to work. Uh, then they have no way to get housing, uh, and they get no very little money, if at all, no health care. Yeah. They land on the streets, they can be beggars, so they get criminal. Then you have a good reason to get, take them away, either imprison them or deport them. And uh, in that way, even though basically almost no more refugees are coming, you keep it floating as a topic. Yeah, and that, I think that it is, is it. sort of keeps mobilizing those voters because otherwise you might lose those extreme right voters because, you know, the scapegoat has vanished. But you have to keep the scapegoat. And so you constantly publish something or then they really become criminal, then you have <laughs> a lot of stories to tell, and so you keep this topic sort of cooking, as mm -hmm. we would say in, in German, yeah, köcheln, uh, so that um, you constantly can mobilize them again. Yeah? It's similar to Trump, of course, who sends in thousands of soldiers for uh, migrants and refugees who are thousands of miles away. Yeah? So uh, sort of creating these situations of fear and uh, of um, insecurity, although mm -hmm. they want to provide security. So I think that this is uh, a measure and a strategy, a very intentional strategy, uh, opportunistic, populist strategy, uh, mm -hmm. to keep uh, sort of the scapegoat 
um, cooking, yeah, as I would say in German. Uh, and what Baumann also mentions in cities, and he's written a, a wonderful paper which uh, Georg has sent to me last week, uh, uh, Cities of Fears and Cities of Hope, um, where he, he talks about the concepts of mixophilia and mixophobia. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so how in cities you could, how do you integrate strangers, yeah? So you can either try to ki kind of cope with them in accepting difference where it's possible until certain legal uh, and human right um, uh, lines, or you have mixophobia, you, so you want to segregate because you're so frightened, yeah? And then happens, you get closed communities, gated communities, everything we have in South Africa or in the States, uh, and we'll get more and more here as well, uh, with security agents and so forth. And the interesting thing is the more security you provide, the more fear emerges. And I find that uh, a very interesting result. So people don't feel more protected because they get so frightened that you need so much gated communities that uh, it even creates more fear. So they're actually completely, um, they don't, don't uh, uh, provide what they say they would provide, but they're all part and parcel of these strategies. Uh, and so I thought, um, yeah, that reminded me of, uh, your talk reminded me a lot of about this. And the issue, what Bauman also talks about, is that the mixophilia people are, of course, also those who are more mobile mm -hmm. and uh, more open and, and probably more educated and so forth, but not only. Yeah, and I think we need more studies there. I think this, this dichotomy probably doesn't work in, in that way alone, because you see many people, like you said, and I also got sent something today uh, from Austrian Caritas, mm -hmm. uh, that this is all not Christian, what is happening here, and that you know people are just getting really angry. And so I would like to say a few words about the counter discourses so that we don't get completely uh, dismal and depressed. Uh, we had a case now uh, again in Austria, which is a quote unquote wonderful field as well for all these uh, phenomena, where a councillor in lower Austria named Waldhäusl uh, uh, who's extreme FPÖ, uh, and he's uh, in charge of dealing with refugees and migrants, uh, decided to put unaccompanied adolescents into a gated house uh, with terrible conditions uh, secured by barbed wire. And he was on television in, in the main news and he was interviewed and he said, we need this barbed wire actually to protect those adolescents from the people outside. Yeah, because, you know, the people outside might, I don't know, want to hurt these adolescents or something. Anyway, that backfired completely. And, uh, and um, lawyers, human rights lawyers went out to this <laughs> camp and it was closed down from one day to the next because it was so scandalous that the civil society protests became mm -hmm. so large, the church, the caritas, uh, human rights lawyers, everybody said this is completely impossible, we know what barbed wires and camps are, Austria with that history, so this is impossible. And it was closed down. Uh, so this is, uh, a a story of success. However, this guy is still part of the government in Lower Austria. So Austria doesn't have the tradition of politicians resigning. Yeah? And if they resign, they come back, like Haider always <laughs> resigned and bounced back. Yeah? So it's not like the UK where you, know, you resign, you resign. Uh, but um, Italian stayed. politicians don't resign yeah. either. And so um, to close my, my comment, I would like to just 
say a few words about the field work. I think that this kind of field work with extreme right groups is extremely difficult. Um, I myself have done some, but uh, I must admit that there was a situation where I basically ran away. Yeah, there was, I did some observation twice on Victor Adlermarkt, which is in the 10th district where mm -hmm. the FPÖ always starts its election campaigns. And we were there with uh, tape recorders, etc. And uh, one of my postdocs was beaten up and we just went off. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, you don't want uh, to, to be wounded. And <coughs> once we did some tape recording on St. Stephen's Square when Haider had his enormous rally and there were 100,000 people on St. Stephen's Square, you couldn't move between Graben and Stephansplatz. And Haider had this big screen, video screen, and he came up like a pop star. <laughs> uh, and um, I was standing there trying to tape again, and there were all these <laughs> you know, thugs around me, and I thought, what am I doing here? I got so scared, you know, and I thought everybody will see that I'm from the other side, and obviously a woman, but also secular Jewish, and what will happen, yeah? And so I ran away. <laughs> and so these situations really, you know, are very frightening. <laughs> And so I wonder if you could tell us more about how you felt in talking to these Casa Pound fascists, yeah? Um, and what, what do you feel? How, how, do you, how do you confront these people? How can you stay silent? How are you not frightened? Um, so I think this is uh, really from an ethnographers and from you know, qualitative research, which we both do, I find that a very difficult question. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much, Ruth. Those uh, really pointed questions and observations. So shall I, shall I yeah, respond? So before we open I, um, up. I wanted to just make a couple of points to your other um, questions. So thank you for bringing up Bauman's work, who is wonderful. And I'm not familiar with with, what she, with this article that you were citing, but he actually wrote a book in Italian together with Ezio Mauro called Babel which I think has been then translated, which makes very kind of similar points. And I think that's very much the case. Um, the other, I think, um, point I wanted to make was regarding kind of the animalization of refugees, because that's exactly what's happening. It's not just the production of illegality, the production of irregular migration. I mean, we're beyond that even. It, it is about actually, you know, kind of stripping away, you know, kind of basic elements of humanity of forcing people out onto the streets. And I think, you know, there there is a kind of a passage point here, which is really, really troubling. Um, yes, the field work. Um, and Aga, I saw that you were in the audience, so maybe, you know, you have some experience with these sorts of characters in Italy as well. So I'd be very curious to hear your comments now. Um, my own kind of approach to Casa Pound came through a kind of curious um, kind of byway. Um, I would not have thought of going to talk to them precisely because I think they're already getting much too much attention um, and, you know, kind of very spectacularly um, because there is this, you know, kind of obsession with finding, you know, the, the scary fascists in Italy, at least in Italian media, um, preferably, you know, kind of uh, one. There's a great cartoonist, Zero Calcare, who's kind of lampooned them, saying, "Yeah, you need to find somebody with like five runes tattooed on his neck, you know, kind of macho black dress, and so on." Which, of course, not all of them dress like that. The way I came to them, though, is I teach or used to teach a field course in Rome for my MA and PhD students in Amsterdam. And uh, there is um, a Dutch institute in Rome um, that has been there for many years. And they were actually contacted a few years back by Casa Pound, by the kind of international outreach person saying, you know, we do tours. We do kind of alternative tours of Rome. If your students, not just my students, but other people arriving there are interested, we're there. And so I heard about this and um, two of my PhD students were like, well, why not? And I was like, you know, I feel really kind of uncomfortable with this. I mean, this is, you know, the kind of voyeurism I really don't want to engage in. It's one thing if I go talk to them, but taking around a group of Dutch PhD students, you know, let's go see the fascists, you know, and actually let's be led around town by the fascists. 
I really don't want to do this. Um, they organized it themselves, so I had to come along. This was my first contact. And I was trying to find Ruth the, the pictures that um, they took from that visit, because there's one of me looking really, really, I mean, I don't know, scared, troubled. I mean, it was, you know, if you looked at my body language, I'm just kind of standing there in the back and thinking, they can look th right through me. They know exactly what I'm thinking. They can tell I want to kill them. Um, they probably want to kill me. And, you know, I could, like, have, like, my whole family history was written on my face. You know, they can, everything. Um, but it was really, you know, interesting to watch that performance. And this was a performance they're giving to a group of foreign students, right? Um, they have an, in this international spokesperson, French-Canadian, by the way. And so that got me thinking, no, this is really something I need to engage with. Um, but it was really difficult because, I mean, through the whole time, I felt like, you know, and I mean, they were very open. It was nothing about, you know, kind of, please don't disclose our names. No, they're very kind of happy to speak. Um, you know, I don't know if the names we were being given, so I did this with a PhD student were real or pseudonyms. Their spokesman's um, last name is Magnificat, which I doubt <laughs> is a real name. No, but joking aside, it is really difficult. Also because I think my struggle, apart from just being afraid, um, is how do I then work with this? How do I present this? I mean, I can tell you I'm uncomfortable even talking about this like this. Um, we wrote um, an article that it's on, it's on its way to being published with one of my students, and there we chose very deliberately not to include any pictures, any imagery whatsoever, nothing. Because it's like, you know, speaking of visibility, there's already kind of too much of this kind of, you know, almost pornographic attention. But it's something that I struggle with, because as much as I think we need to talk about this, and we need to kind of also understand the very kind of perilous proximity between these movements and the Lega, and that's, it's, a, there's a very, it's not even proximity. I mean, we're there. How do you do that? So um, if any of you <laughs> looking at you, I want to add to that. I mean, it's something, you know, and, and that's why I'm very happy to have the opportunity also, Ruth, in dialogue with you to kind of to think about, you know, how do you engage with this as researchers? I mean, for me, it's a scholarly problem, but it's also a very political problem, yeah. very much so. So, so any I advice I greatly appreciated. If I may just add, I had a big discussion with Are Mick Billig. Oh, I had a big discussion with Mick Billig also about that because he wrote this mm. first book on British fascism uh, long ago about do we publish those pictures? Yeah, if we publish those pictures, they get you know more attention and exactly. they and we disseminate their propaganda. On the other hand, if we don't publish the pictures and don't deconstruct them, then, you know, who would do that? <coughs> so it's, it's, I think it's a really big problem, and even if we publish them and, and comment them and analyze them, then people can still just take the picture out now on the internet, you sure. know, you can do Absolutely. everything, and recontextualize it anywhere. So I find it really a dilemma, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, how to do that, if we should just publish them black and white, but then you can't analyze the colors, <coughs> colors are important. So, you know, how do you deal with this? I think it's a really, really big issue of not <coughs> just how much attention, but how do we get to understand them, yeah? What they yeah. do. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a big issue when you write about them. And mm -hmm. the second thing is we don't get into their backstage. And that's actually the, would be the most interesting site to look at is what do they do when they don't have their PR people around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do they talk about? So you, you would have to smuggle yourself in, you know, like Valera for, mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically impossible almost impossible, yeah? And, you know, and I thought, I mean, one of my students was saying, you know, she was willing to do that, and I was very worried about yeah. that, you know, kind of so participating in rallies and so on, um, just, you yeah. know. But, I mean, certainly that would add something much more to it, mm. yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. Let's open it up. Uh, yeah. Andras first, uh, Ivan in the back. <coughs> Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I have uh, just a couple of further thoughts and maybe mm -hmm. questions. I am interested in whether there is any uh, correspondence or correlation between the treatment of migrants and the treatment of 
other discriminated uh, minorities, like homeless. If they treat the homeless badly, uh, does it mean that there is a higher probability that they treat the migrants the same way, or there is no correlation? The other, is there any correlation between the, uh, whether the city is rich or not so rich? So the economic situation of the city and the treatment of the migrants. One can maybe think that if there is a better economic situation in the city, then there are more working opportunities and migrants can work and then can be better integrated. While on the other extreme is maybe Detroit when you know the whole city is going down and that um, affects the social relationships. My third point is the relationship between state and society. So where is the borderline between the state action, I am, I am looking this picture, Polizia, and the social uh, yeah. non-statist uh, forms of discrimination. So, so uh, let me, so maybe some, uh, some examples are taken from the political sphere that political parties police, uh, politicians, others uh, discriminate the migrants. But what if they don't discriminate, but the society or different communities are doing this? Exactly. And uh, whether you pay any or you find it in this interesting in your own research to differentiate between statist repression and societal uh, community repression. Um, we are also talking about public spaces and public institutions, and there are certain gatekeepers here. And you mentioned this, uh, the case of the public parks, mm -hmm. you know, that migrants go there and so on. I remember when I was in Germany, there was a huge park, and uh, one end of the park there were the Turkish uh, people, they were cooking their food, and the other end were the non-Turkish, the, the local Germans. And there was no police, there was no repression, just a sort of segre spontaneous segregation. So I wonder whether you uh, consider these sort of uh, not so direct forms of uh, discrimination. And the other thing is just uh, uh, maybe you can consider also other inst public institutions when gatekeepers try to, to keep uh, migrants out, like uh, public health care institutions, hospitals, mm -hmm. or schools, maybe. Uh, just a friend of mine told me yesterday that they are now sending their little boy to an uh, Austrian school here in Vienna. And uh, he is five years old and will be in school next year. And, and there was an admission procedure. Uh, but basically, they did not check the little boy, but the parents. What is your profession? Are you a university professor? That's okay. So there is a, there is a screening mechanism. It was a, a school director. It's, it's not the police. It's, is it societal or public? So uh, these uh, different uh, uh, forms of repression, it is not necessarily always the state. It is behind the state, other things. Thank you. Uh, Aisha. No, no, well, let's move the microphone, not backwards and forwards. Okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I will, my one question that follows is that from Andras' question, what kind of cities? Because mm -hmm. it's a kind of a story, yes, it is not an Italian story. It's Absolutely. not only an Italian yeah. story. And it's in so many places, but like you said that you wanted to uh, touch down to the space mm -hmm. and and what kind of spaces of course cities but what kind of mm -hmm. what kind of cities that the mm -hmm. uh, that are more prone to that kind of uh, mobilizations and counter mobilizations yeah. because I think there are also counter discourses Absolutely. and uh, activities there and and I think what you're telling us is not actually the basically the story about the refugees or the migrants but about it is also you see very strongly the kind of the injuries of neoliberal urbanism yeah. Absolutely. That where which created incredible kind of precarities and 
majority of the yeah. uh, city population. And there I would like to, and I think that is this whole uh, language of care comes into it and then longing for a state care, yeah. and which is very much related mm -hmm. with this kind of uh, abandonment. And I was wondering whether you see, because I'm not familiar with the uh, Italian case, but in some other places where the discourses and language of dignity comes mm -hmm. into, the, uh, into the picture. Uh, so it is, sometimes it's not really about the migrants, but it is about that abandonment. And then, of course, that the migrants mm -hmm. and the refugees become very uh, handy in that. So I would like to ask one question is in terms of what kind of cities where you could see these kind of injuries more acute or their yeah. effects so that uh, it's uh, sweeping. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that I think it is very important to look at this the heterogeneity of those uh, yeah. groups in terms of what, as you were referring to, yes, I'm a communist, but I mean, they're caring and this kind of uh, issues. And I think that, especially in Italy, uh, this neighborhood watch was very much with the left that was very much uh, actually on the basis of communitarian community taking care of itself and right to the city being appropriated by various different yep. uh, kinds of uh, groups. So I think it's, there is a kind of a history coming uh, into, uh, into that. And then, I mean, for, I, I think, unfortunately, that we see that in uh, several uh, places that uh, we see. So what kind of, kind of uh, different kind of cities that we see. And one point in relation to your question that I'm a veteran of that kind of uh, research. I was thrown out by the, uh, uh, when I did my research with the extreme right wing at the first stage I did. But then, uh, like you were saying, that I felt so nervous. And I think that my nervousness and anxieties were very much uh, carried over and reflected back, and I was thrown out. Okay. So uh, I cannot say a good, uh, give a good advice. Thank you very much. It was extremely interesting. So I'll try to provoke you on two things. First, you talk about two different regimes of insecurity. Yeah. The way you're telling how you feel among these people is how these people are telling you that people feel amongst the migrants. And this is part of the kind of a shared insecurity for different reasons. Everybody basically feels insecure in these groups. But my question is the following. If you are not going to tell me that these people are fascists, and you are just telling me what they are doing in this city, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go with Lega. In a certain way, I have a much more sympathy for what these fascists of yours are doing than basically what Lega is doing. And what I'm saying, there is an abundant city in Italy, and there are social groups that are genuinely abundant. Mm -hmm. And they're making them visible. Absolutely. So from this point of view, one of the ways to do this is empower people by making them visible. So if I don't know the other things that they're doing, mm -hmm. they're present there, and they're saying, we're staying. Yeah. We're staying with you. Yeah. We are part of you. So what you're talking about, Lega is different. Lega is telling to the, the same abundant people, do you know what? We are taking care of you, but not taking care of the migrants. They're not making them visible. So from this point, and this is even talking about the classical social terms, Lega is very much a middle class movement in the way they came. I mean, the classical, this, this was the Northern League. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this point of view, these fascists, they basically used the refugee crisis to empower and to make visible certain parts of the Italian society that have been economically and socially cut. Uh, so they really empowered some people. Uh, and here I'm going just uh, 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 to understress these uh, beautiful distinctions that both of you made is paradoxically, the poor and underprivileged local people, you're empowering them by making them visible. 
with the migrants is you are kind of imp empowering them, making them invisible for a while. They don't want everybody to look at them when they go on the streets and how different they are and so on. And I do believe that it's very interesting, this type of uh, different type of empowerments. But I'm making these distinctions because in a certain way, it's not the same. It, it, I'm just mm -hmm. relying on your uh, narrative, sure. basically, of what you told me, these are two different approaches. And if you decide you basically get a much more sympathetic view and you don't know the other views of these people, fascists and so on, they're going to say they made a use out of the refugee crisis to make visible the victims in their own societies. And here I'm going to end up with one statistics. Just uh, these days, either today or yesterday, uh, there was a study being done in several European countries about migration. And here is the interesting data. 86% of the Italians much more cared about people that have left Italy than the people that have come. The problem of the abandonment, it, this is the third group that you are not going to see anymore. And we're talking about around one million people. Uh, so from this point of view, having these different groups and making distinctions between the legger who said to these poor Italians, I'm going to take care of you by basically persecuting migrants, and the fascist who said, I'm here with you, I'm one of you, probably I don't like the migrants, but I make you visible, okay. you're here, you're one of me. In my view, they're different strategies. Thank you. Okay, back to Louisa. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I'll start, actually, I'll start with your questions, Ivan, and thank you for that. Um, also, I think, for pointing out to our discussion of our own kind of, let's say, insecurity. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I realized when I was doing this that I was kind of playing a role as well, you know, trying to act really tough, and um, I didn't know how well that worked. But um, going to your point about how the Lega and Casa Pound adopt very different strategies, it's interesting because the old Lega, which was very territorially grounded, very strongly local, I mean, it was born originally as a federalist movement, was very much bound to, you know, kind of the things we do in the community from, you know, kind of local banking to all forms of, you know, kind of social and economic support. They have lost that. I mean, that's still there, but it's not at all in like a you know, kind of national politics. And that's really interesting because I think um, you're right. I mean, they play with the, in this case, with the kind of forced visibilization of migrants by throwing them out onto the street, but also kind of removing them from view and removing them from the law. But in terms of, you know, although the rhetoric is there saying, you know, Italians first, yes, it's not these sorts of direct action policies, absolutely not. And the reason I wanted to bring to your attention that quote from Repubblica, where you know they cite this old guy who was actually a communist activist saying, I don't care, they're actually doing these things. And so you know they're there, they're present. And so that has been very successful. And I think that's what, in a sense, convinced me talking to these guys in Rome, but also kind of reading the press, that they are being, you know, apart from the electoral success, these sorts of territorial politics are working. And they've also taken over, which kind of goes to your point, Saisha, um, the kind of, um, let's say, a uh, gap um, in kind of organizational structures that were previously provided, for example, by communist party clubs or other, you know, kind of forms of territorial organization. They have kind of gone directly into, you know, kind of that absence, taking over their, you know, the same kind of tactics, whether it's, you know, um, squatting or, you know, doing all sorts of other, you know, kind of um, territorial works. So I think, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, so kind of going backwards, I shall, I'll go back to the other points that you made. Um, I like the fact that both you and Andras, you as well, made the link immediately to kind of, um, a broader question of, you know, the, the neoliberal city and, you know, the displacement, not just of, you know, certain subjects out of view, but also to the language that is used. And, you know, you made the point about, you know, using the very same kind of framings for the homeless that are undesirable and should be removed from public space and actually legalized out of, you know, space. And so when, when um, I was looking at some of the, you know, kind of the arguments they're making, I mean, you could you know, draw direct parallels to anti-homeless ordinances and the sort of language that was being used in North America, certainly, but also in the UK. 
um, and the sort of imaginaries that were being appealed to of, you know, of those who should be out of view and who do not have the right to belong in space. Yeah. And so you know, I think that's, that's very much there. Um, so you, know, you, you refer to it as the injuries of neoliberal urbanism. Those are very real. And in Italy, they're very, very real. They're very visible, whether it's in a city like Rome, but also other medium-sized cities. And I think, um, you know, to your point of which cities somehow are more prone to support these movements, it's interesting because cities, in a sense, where, um, I mean, I can, you know, I can think of Rome, which is probably the worst example, because it is a city at collapse. And not just because of the injuries of neoliberalism, it's because of the injuries of a whole series of Roman administrations as well. Um, but certainly, you can look to cities in the northeast of Italy, um, which, I mean, that was, you know, the rich region, you know, not just the, you know, the, of Lega support, but where this is becoming quite visible as well, and where these movements are beginning to get appeal. But even places like Luca, and I wanted to mention Luca because I think, you know, to people studying Italian politics, I mean, Luca of all places, no. Um, and instead, you know, instead, yes. Um, and so I think um, that, you know, there is a huge kind of geographical differentiation there. And it's not just, you know, kind of the peripheries and the center. And that's why I think I'm so troubled also by the rhetoric surrounding the Gilets jaunes uh, mobilization, because also, you know, the French case is much, much more heterogeneous. Um, I think that's something that we need to understand how, you know, how that is refracted. But, you know, kind of back to the point of capturing not just the spaces, but the strategies of left autonomous movements, they're exactly doing that and, and very successfully. Um, and I think one more point to go back um, to your questions, Andras. So I think definitely the swing between other, you know, kind of uh, marginalized urban populations, whether homeless or otherwise, is very much there. Um, the correlation between kind of geographies and unemployment and, um, you know, kind of perceptions, state of economy and um, uh, feelings or uh, towards migrants, it's not that direct at all. And it's interesting because certainly in Italy, the areas with the highest unemployment are not the areas mostly with the highest numbers of migrants at all. Um, but there the question of perception is really interesting. Um, so Ipsos Mori does these uh, kind of perils of perception index that just came out recently again. And so they're asking Italians, but also a whole series of other, you know, kind of national contexts. How many migrants do you think are in Italy? And in Italy the spread was, you know, I think people were estimating it as like 28% of the national population where it's, you know, four. How many of those do you think are Muslim? Same thing here, you know, huge kind of spread. Um, so I think that's, you know, kind of um, very relevant. Now, um, the final kind of point that you made is, you know, kind of actual form, like state directed, but also kind of, let's say, um, yeah, kind of grounded forms of uh, segregation, perhaps. I mean, city life is messy. And the example that you were giving of the park, where you have different kind of constituencies, communities, I wouldn't even think of that as segregation. I mean, you know, you have kind of cohabitation, perhaps. And um, I've been having this kind of ongoing discussion with one of my PhD students who's looking at you know, kind of cosmopolitan port cities in the Mediterranean and this, you know, illusion of these perfect places where everybody mixed and you know, people hated each other. You just kind of tolerated each other. And I don't even know if I want to use that word. But, you know, you did your thing. And, you know, and I think again of Trieste, which is a great example. And if you go to the city park, which is right along the seaside, you'll see kind of the teenagers on one side. The old ladies having a picnic, like right in the middle, you know, then, you know, old ladies playing cards on the other side, it's, you know, it's kind of self, you know, it's, I think it's a kind of chosen, you know, um, separation. I'm not saying that the segregation does not exist. Of course it does. But I think, you know, um, cities are much more kind of complex. And your last point about the citizen detective. All right. So how various agents and I'm using this term, so a term that a colleague of mine uses. Um, how people are kind of called up to do this work of bordering in cities, whether as school teachers, emergency, you know, um, aid workers. I mean, um, you know, before we had the Lega, we had Berlusconi and the Berlusconi Lega government. And, you know, as part of the famous Bossifini law and other immigration laws, they wanted to, you know, kind of criminalize irregular migration and called upon everybody from healthcare workers to teachers to report illegals. 
and you know there was a reaction to that from teachers unions doctors unions saying no I'm not going to you know if somebody arrives in the emergency room kind of declaring to the authorities that was quite a few years ago what would happen now I don't know but you know th that's still not part of the proposals of this law but I think you know we need to think of how it's a much broader set of yeah Okay, we have time for a very quick second round, and I'll collect, uh, let's begin over there. Hi. Oh. oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I have a very quick question, and it sound, might sound a bit trivial, but I was wondering to what extent politics of memory enters the language of space reconstruction, uh, yes. because when you talk about Ostia, I, I think about about, you know, history of... Uh, the old of, Ostia. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, in this case, to what extent does this happen? Uh, and uh, related to that, um, the relationship with Mussolini, in a way, I mean, is that, is, again, is, the, is that found, in a way, in the language, or is this just kind of legacy of Mussolini, a bit, I don't know, symbolic, or like because they're right-wing, and to what extent did they um, take on that language of imperialism as well, and so forth, so thank you. Thanks. Well, my, my question sort of related to this one. Okay. But uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. As you see, I found it very interesting, and this is how I found myself on these very uncomfortable <laughs> stairs. <laughs> but I also liked very much that we could hear both your talks, because I, I think one of the interesting things that came across was that Ruth was talking about language, and you were talking very much about this politics of visibility. and. My question relates to this one. You said how there's this communist who said that who cares whether these people are fascists. And I think that probably until a few decades ago, very few people would say that, but now it's becoming more acceptable. So the way that people use words like racist, fascists, I think it's becoming sort of more acceptable and more like mainstream, and people don't worry as much. And I think that this is probably common, unfortunately, in many, many countries, but I wonder, how, do you notice that in the Italian case? Because of the history of Italy, it's interesting to see to what an extent this is really like that. You know. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> I learned so much, so thank you. So I have a, I have, I'm sorry, my, my throat is terrible today. So I have a few questions. First, relates to the question of context that both of you raised. To what extent it's uh, it's local or international phenomenon? And we know that it's international. But uh, as Luisa pointed pointed out, I do field work myself among Italian, Polish, and Hungarian far right at the moment, and I was really struck because I was thinking when I was looking at some of your quotes, and I thought I heard it too. Exactly the very same formulation. These people are also sometimes trained to talk in in particular Absolutely. way. A point I would like to return to in my second comment. But on the other hand, the context is so important too. And yeah. here, the two things I wanted to mention: so this, this idea of care racism, which I think mm -hmm. is a fascinating concept. But, but that's in a way a reformulation of this idea of ordo caritas, the Augustinian one, that many groups in the countries where the Christian heritage is still so important, even if it's some kind of a cultural heritage. These groups yeah. refer to it saying, oh, this is a Christian idea. We, have, if we first help people close to us, and only then, if we have enough resources, we help others. This is not about races, it's about or ordo caritas, right? So the context is important here because some, in some contexts it will matter more than in others. And the second point related to the question of context, you mentioned that there is this there is this constant sort of astonishment nowadays, or this, this far-right groups are adopting the left-wing tactics and strategies, but these are also fascist Absolutely. tactics. Yeah. So this is not something very new. Yeah. This is what, what yeah. was common in Italy. So when this man is saying, oh, I'm a communist, I don't care, but perhaps he's familiar with that, because that's what was done in the 20s and 30s, and Mussolini introduced, say, this thing, this Casa Popolare, Reddito Sociale, it was all exactly. there, right? So it's... This idea of them borrowing from the left, someone already borrowed from the left in the past, okay. and actually fascism was, was neither left nor right at the end of the day, right? Uh, so um, yes. the second, I found this so important what you said about this hunting for fascism, because I think 
fascism, the idea of fascism and fascists, the way it is used by the press nowadays is just calling it, killing a discussion. It doesn't lead us to understand yeah. these people better and this phenomena. It's just to say that this is an absolute evil and we, don't, we shouldn't deal with them. But very often, like a North might be, might, might be more problematic than this fascist that we are dealing with. Yeah. And this lead me, leads me to the question of fieldwork and how dangerous it is and how frightening. Because we just said about the similarity of these quotes, right? That these people will be telling us the same things in mm -hmm. Poland, Forza Nuova, and Casa Pound. But an anthropologist always asks when speaking about fieldwork, we don't think that much about interviews, and I am sure will agree. We think about observing these people, and we yeah. ask, okay, what they tell by what they do. Yeah. So it's one thing to hear them, what they tell about the importance of distributing food and collecting packages, and I heard a lot about it. Only when I started going to the distribution and saying how they treat the people who come, I understood so much more about it, right? whether they talk to these people respectfully, whether they actually make, make fun of their accent yeah. because they are from a poor working class background. And you see a lot, we see, you see both, okay. right? But speaking of this dangerousness, and because I've been following this group for two years now, and I do go to the rallies, I go to the meetings, I go with them by bus to participate in commission of Mussolini, and I'm hardly ever afraid by now. I got used to them, they got used to me. Although they know what I think, that I don't agree, but only because of that they accept me because they know I don't agree and they find it challenging and interesting. But there is something I'm much more afraid of, which is that this field work, as any field work, is extremely exhausting. And I've, I'm, I feel very privileged that I have a lot of friends in Italy and after a difficult day I can have a dinner with a friend. And sometimes this friend is telling me the very same thing that the thyroid group is telling me, but he just says it with a low, with a saying, you know, Italy doesn't really manage with immigrants now, it's too much for us. He just doesn't, or he, she or he doesn't dare to say it loudly as this group. See, this mm -hmm. is something I'm much more afraid of, that these groups are, that this really is becoming a mainstream thing. Okay. And so, paradoxically, these friends of mine, the fact that they start ha having these views, and actually someone could say, oh, they only think it, while these other people actually do something about it, they at least help, help this Italian poor, right? Someone could make this argument. So there are also different uh, registers of not only of fear, but of danger thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry for my language. No, that, I mean, that was super helpful. Do we, do we have the time? Final, yeah. Final thank you so much. And actually, I think in replying to your questions, I can reply to both of your questions, because um, I didn't say anything about that just kind of for, for, for reasons of time. But I mean, uh, even though Casa Pound defines itself as fascist of the third millennium, they are firmly drawing upon the legacy of social fascism. And that's, you know, that's the great kind of powerful thing they can do because they present themselves both as a new movement you know, to tackle current and future challenges, but at the same time, they can claim, lay claim to that legacy. I mean, and it was amazing. So this first tour that we were given with the students through the building, through their headquarters, the whole kind of internal staircase has this exhibition celebrating the achievements of fascist women. And as we were walking, you know, they were telling us about the social policies, especially gender policies of Italian fascism, how they were the ones who invented women's rights and also workers' rights, by the way, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I mean, it's very much there. So kind of to back to your point of a politics of memory, they draw directly on that. And even, you know, that, that stupid sign on the building which was just put there. I mean, it looks like, you know, kind of it's meant to kind of mimic a Roman sign. You know, it's like this idea of permanence, of laying claim to that legacy. So that's very much there. Um, to your point, um, Clevena, about, you know, kind of that it's suddenly become acceptable. I think in part it has um, much more, but I think it's much more kind of insidious. And I think this is, you know, what you're saying, Aga, that it's not, you know, there, and I think that's where the danger in kind of, uh, a folkloric almost view of these groups lies where you know you kind of isolate them you say oh, well these are you know the the guys in dark you know uh, clothes whatever bomber jackets now they have their own fashion line by the way right um, and you don't kind of think about how these things manifest themselves and have entered into acceptable you know kind of popular debate. And Ruth, I mean, you've written extensively about this. And I think this is the thing that scares me. You're right. I mean, I'm much less scared because I mean, by now I know what these guys are going to tell me. They know who I am. You know, it's the same thing. I'm much more troubled when I see these things seeping out. Um, 
and I think that's you know that's where we need to kind of draw our attention. But of course, you know, in a sense, you know, they're they're much easier to study anthropologically or geographically. I mean, you know, because they perform for us. Um, how you capture a kind of a diffuse feeling um, and how you capture a shifting public discourse. I mean, of course, you can look at the media, but where it becomes kind of accepted to speak about migration, migrants, but also precarity in, in different ways. Because I think, you know, kind of to your points of, you know, the neoliberal city, I mean, these are exactly the same words that are being used. So, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you very much again to all and of you time. and for the engaged discussion and questions. Uh, we uh, now have a wine and cheese, uh, as we call it in IWM jargon, downstairs. You're all invited, and obviously, to uh, enjoy the drinks and the food, but to continue the discussion with Louisa and uh, Ruth. And But before we do that, please join me in thanking Louisa and Ruth. Thank you, and thank you, Ruth, again for being willing to do this.